in Japan burst in 1991. In terms of the nominal GDP growth rate, uh, the average uh, growth rate uh, for 20 years is neg was negative. And in terms of the real GDP growth rate, um, the, uh, the growth rate is just above the zero, uh, in spite of the much higher growth in the European uh, advanced countries and the United States. But why is the big problem for Japan? Um, I think uh, the basic, the fundamental reason of the low uh, economic growth rate is deflation. Um, deflation means that uh, persistent decline of um, uh, prices of goods and services. But uh, if you have only a decline of uh, goods and prices, you'll be happy because you can buy more at the same prices. But unfortunately, defla deflation uh, accompany the con persistent decline of the wages. So that's the very serious problem aspect uh, of deflation. So we had suffered from deflation for uh, 15 years in terms of the uh, CPI, core CPI, uh, since uh, 1998. Uh, immediately after the consumption tax hike in 1997 from 3% to 5%, and also the East Asian currency crisis, and uh, uh, after the uh, financial crisis uh, in, in Japan in 1997, we, a Japanese economy, macroeconomy, dipped into the deflation and then we continue to fail to get out of deflation. The government and Bank of Japan uh, have been uh, fully aware of the seriousness of the problem, but our commitment has been not uh, enough, sufficient, to get out of deflation. And, um, you know, when the commodity prices are going down, the value of the cash and uh, fixed um, uh, income uh, securities like government bond or corporate bonds, uh, they, their value uh, continue to uh, ra rise. So the best action under the deflationary situation is to save money um, by the government bond instead of investing in the stocks or investing in the capital uh, uh, business uh, 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 investment. So. Um, the savings rate is going high, and the company tend to hoard as much money uh, as possible as the internal reserves. So uh, the Japanese economy has been very inactive for, for 15 years. And then finally, um, when the Shinzo Abe uh, ran for the election, presidential election for the current ruling party, LDP, in September uh, uh, 2012, uh, even before he took office as the prime minister, he declared that we should take a bold step to get out of deflation. And then, even before he became uh, prime minister in Japan, the market reacted very quickly. First, the Japanese yen started to be depreciated, and the stock market started to go up. So um, finally, he became a prime minister as a result of the general election in December. And he appointed the new governor of Bank of Japan, Mr. Kuroda, uh, in March uh, 2013. The Abenomics started. So uh, Abenomics consists of three arrows. Why three arrows? Uh, it based on the old epics uh, that uh, the landlord of uh, uh, Choshu area, it means the western part of Japan, currently called uh, Yamaguchi-ken, that Mr. Prime Minister Abe is originally from. Uh, the landlord, um, Mori, uh, uh, gave a lesson to his, his three sons uh, by saying that only one arrow could be easily broken, but three arrows, uh, when the three arrows bundled together, the three arrows could not be easily broken. So three arrows should cooperate. The three arrows mean three sons should cooperate each other to achieve the successful result. So the first arrow uh, by uh, Abenomics is the aggressive, uh, bold um, monetary easing policy, uh, together with the uh, numerical commodity pr uh, stability uh, target, what we call inflation targeting policy of mild 2% inflation. 
The second arrow is a timely fiscal stimulus. The third arrow is supply side policy for the growth, economic growth. Um, I think the basic uh, idea behind the abenomics is the first arrow to get out of deflation. So uh, without getting out of deflation, all the uh, policy measures would fail uh, because then the mindset uh, is very negative. You, if and when you uh, experience the uh, conti persistent, continual uh, decline of the commodity prices, you expect that the commodity prices would go down forever. So uh, they, they, they're not uh, consuming, they're not you know, uh, investing. I mean, the corporate sector will not con con uh, uh, investing under the deflationary uh, uh, circumstances. So the first priority to, to get out of the deflation, to change the mindset from negative one to the positive one. And now uh, it is on the halfway to the target. The current uh, in February the, uh, or March, the CPI, the commodity prices, has already been reached to the 1.3, um, 1.4 percent uh, compared to the previous year. So, um, but not, uh, the target is not achieved yet, but are we are on the halfway. But as of the 1st of April, uh, as Dokel mentioned that we uh, raised the consumption tax uh, from 5 percent to 8 percent. So uh, we will see the uh, substantial decline uh, in terms of the consumption and investment for three months from April, May, June. But after that, uh, from July, uh, um, August, September, we will expect, we expect the uh, uh, substantial recovery from the uh, bottom line uh, 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 of the decline uh, because of the tax, uh, consumption tax hike. So um, somehow, uh, the uh, law has already been uh, passed two years ago to the effect that we should uh, decide in December uh, for the further round of ta consumption tax hike from 8% to 10%, which should be implemented in uh, October 2015, next year. So it will be a very difficult uh, decision, but uh, we will watch and uh, see and uh, very carefully what's going on. Uh, it is inevitable for the economy's decline for three months, but what's going on after that, it's a very important um, uh, uh, elements for the prime minister to, to decide another round of tax hike. The second uh, arrow will be the stimulus uh, by fiscal policy. But as you know, we are suffering from the accumulated huge budget deficit for many years. So there are some limits for uh, economic uh, stimulus, but it's one time operation to build up the economy, to provide the confidence to the consumers and corporate sector. So, um, so far it is uh, very uh, effective. The third arrow is supply side uh, uh, policy. It, it contains a lot of um, uh, policy measures and covering a wide range of um, 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 supply uh, uh, of capacity building, say the reform, uh, reform, uh, regulatory reform, and the tax reform, and strengthening of the workforce, or something like that. So we can decide, uh, discuss in details uh, for the, uh, the third arrow. Now the uh, uh, attention is focused on the third arrow, and the, the government is going to publish the new revised report for the third arrow in June this year. Thank you. Thank you, Anderson. That's that's quite good. I've, I'd like to now switch over to Paul. Uh, sure. And Paul has uh, done a lot of work in Japan. Has been at uh, Osaka University and has also been advisor to the Bank of Japan. And I'd like to ask Paul his view on Abenomics. <coughs> Thank you very much, Toko. Um, and uh, I think we were asked to sort of try to tell the audience something they may not know. So I'll, in, in that spirit, I'll try to throw some sort of bombs in here. Um, but uh, so evaluation of Abenomics, what, what I like to do, first of all, is point out that um, you really have to define your term. What does Abenomics mean? Obviously, it's a very clever uh, kind of catchy word, almost uh, uh, with a political marketing angle to it. Uh, but it's really two things, I believe, in a nutshell. One is the idea of using uh, macro policy, monetary policy, and fiscal policy to overcome deflation. 
And the second is to use supply-side reforms to, uh, to lift real growth. So when you think about it that way, and as Mr. Honda explained, it's actually really quite a conventional kind of policy mix. It's nothing sort of spectacular rocket science here. So why is it significant? Well, the significance is that, of course, Japan has been in deflation for so long, so it hasn't had a macro policy mix that is conducive to uh, operating under price stability. Uh, so it is very important that Japan gets out of deflation. And so the most significant part of uh, Abenomics, in my view, is the monetary policy shift that Mr. Uh, Honda referred to. Uh, which happened in March of last year. And, and just to sort of, I, I can't really emphasize too much how significant this policy shift was. Because under the former governor, uh, Governor Shirakawa, uh, the mantra of the Bank of Japan was essentially that monetary policy on its own was incapable of overcoming deflation. That the cause of deflation was declining real growth, driven by demographics. And therefore, to solve deflation, you needed to tackle those real economy issues. Now, Mr. Kuroda is taking a much more orthodox view, uh, which is saying, hold on a minute, uh, monetary policy, uh, inflation, deflation is a kind of monetary phenomenon. Monetary policy belongs to the central bank. Uh, we can use monetary policy to end deflation. And he launched into a very aggressive a quantitative easing program last April. So that shift is highly significant. It's really a battle of ideas. It's going from a central bank that essentially had thrown in the towel on doing its job to achieve operational price stability to saying, no, we can do it and we are going to do it. Uh, and and that, so that train has left the station. Now, let me tell you something that you sort of may, a couple of things you, you may not know. One is that uh, around this fable of the three arrows, I find it a little bit ironic because, as Mr. Honda explained, the whole point of the three arrows is to say you have to do these three things together. That's where you get the policy strength. And that was much more consistent with policy under the previous regime, particularly Governor Shirakawa, who was saying we have to do monetary policy and structural reform together. One alone won't do the trick. Whereas the economic theory or philosophy under Abenomics, as I understand it, is actually that uh, ending deflation is, is a good thing. Doing structural reform to lift real growth is also a good thing. But you don't need to do one to achieve the other aim. So that's an interesting kind of uh, almost rhetorical irony in, uh, in Abenomics. But let me tell you also something that you probably don't know, which is that the Abenomics as a policy idea and as a policy uh, direction actually preceded Mr. Abe. Uh, in fact, I've called it nodonomics because the idea of having a policy mix in Japan that, end, that served to end deflation and raise real growth was actually written into the consumption tax legislation that was passed in August of 2012 with LDP support, but under the previous governor, government of Mr. Noda. And the idea was that policymakers in Japan said, sitting there in 2012, uh, Japan uh, has got a very bad fiscal position. And we've just had this Euro sovereign debt crisis in Europe. We can't wait any longer. We must now move to double the consumption tax from 5% to 10%. And that legislation was passed in August of 2012. But there was a policy debate at the time. And of course, many people pushed back and said, hold on a minute. You're crazy. You can't double the consumption tax, which would be a major fiscal consolidation, uh, when you have a deflating economy and you have a central bank that is essentially refusing to take aggressive action uh, to end deflation and achieve, say, 2% inflation. So actually, in that legislation, it was written in as a condition that in order to proceed with the consumption tax hikes, uh, policies would have to be put in place to achieve over the, ne the, the current decade 3% uh, nominal GDP growth, comprising of 2% real growth and 1% positive deflator. That all preceded Mr. Abe, who came in as Prime Minister in December 2012. That's not to uh, you know, undermine the concept of Abenomics. Simply, it is to point out that actually it's a little bit more complicated what's going on in Japan. And one of the things that I've pointed out in some of my reports or raised as a, as a question mark is that is this whole Abenomics policy agenda, including the ships at the Bank of Japan, which are real, but is it really 
uh, a single-minded focus on ending deflation, which I think is very necessary, and I'm fully supportive of that, or is it a bit of a kind of kabuki, a bit of a Trojan horse, whereby the policy alibi, if you like, is put in place to give the fiscal hawks in Japan the uh, justification and the wherewithal to push through with uh, fiscal consolidation in the form of doubling the consumption tax. And let me finish by just coming back, looping that discussion back to the second arrow. The first arrow is very clear. Use monetary policy to end deflation. The third arrow is very clear. Use structural reform to raise real growth, supply side reforms. The second arrow sort of is a little bit more ambiguous. I'm not sure what it says up there, fiscal stimulus. The second arrow actually says <coughs> f flexible fiscal policy for two to three years, and this came out at the end of 2012, so basically through the end of 2015, to support the recovery and the re revitalization of the economy. And yet, one year into that two to three year program, uh, Japan has pushed ahead to raise the consumption tax. And so I think this is a somewhat risky move that you are putting your foot on the monetary accelerator, I'm very supportive of that, at the same time putting, starting to tap at least on the fiscal consolidation uh, break. And we've seen in previous administrations, the Hashimoto administration in the mid-90s and the Koizumi administration in the 2000s, a very similar kind of policy thrust in Japan, trying to end deflation but using monetary policy on the one hand, but then moving prematurely to fiscal consolidation on the other on the other hand. I'll come back to the growth agenda perhaps a little bit later talk off, but okay. just leave I it there. I appreciate the that. You you both raised some very interesting questions in my mind and the last one you were talking about, why do you start the consumption tax in the middle of trying to do stimulus, you know, deflationary period? And so I'd like to get at that a little bit later. Uh, John Cadonis is president and CEO of Mizuho Securities in USA and has uh, had a lot of interesting time working in a Japanese uh, organization and has a very good viewpoint from the stand standards of people here in the U.S. towards Japan. John? Sure. Um, a lot of people ask me what are my thoughts are in terms of uh, is Abenomics working. And um, from my seat, I have a very interesting view because I, I follow money all over the world, what investors are doing, either retail investors domestically in Japan, institutional investors and the lifers, and also the, the investors in the United States and the rest of the world, uh, you know, the macro hedge funds and the, uh, and the long onlys too. And it's a, it tells a very interesting story as to what's working and what's not working. Uh, let me begin by saying I was in Tokyo just earlier this month, and there's clearly, in my opinion, a huge change in sentiment. I've never seen as many cranes in the city that I have in the last 10 years. It was hard to get a hotel reservation. It was hard to get a restaurant reservation. For the first time, the mega banks are raising wages uh, to the tune of 2.2%, uh, and if you're taking bonuses, approximately 5.7%. That's the biggest move uh, that these banks and other corporates have raised their wages in the last 18 years. So that's a, that's a big difference. Inflation for the first time in over 20 years. Last year, I think it was um, minus 0.74. This year, it's going to clock in at approximately 1.5%. That's a huge, huge change. And it's going to take time, uh, but it's working. And it's working slowly. And people can say, well, what happened last year? Markets were booming. The Nikkei went through the roof. The yen obviously depreciated, uh, and this year it's, 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 it's turned. Well, I can speak to that in terms of the Nikkei. Uh, the, what has happening in the Nikkei doesn't necessarily correlate exactly with what's going on in the economy. Uh, we've seen that here in the United States. We're seeing that there. A big part of the move was the market got ahead of itself. This process is going to take a long time. and so. A lot of the macro hedge who are in hedge funds that are into this trade, the carry trade, a lot more short term. They had to take profits against their losses for some of the hedge funds. And that's what we saw a lot of the selling going off. But if you look at the institutional money in the Americas, uh, what we're seeing is 
they're still at weight, market weight, if not still underweight and adding to positions. They're being a lot more particular as to what they're buying. Uh, some of the real, real successful corporates last year, they're selling those and buying into some more of the domestic corporates that um, feel that there's a lot more upside. But there's, there, let's not kid ourselves, there's still room to buy. On a global weight, if you look at foreign money in Japan, uh, the Americas is still underweighted compared to the rest of the world. The rest of the world's got about a 20% weighting, and we're at 13, so we still have catch-up to do. So there's a lot of upside in the market. So in terms of the markets, um, that's definitely helping. Also, we need to look at what's going on around behind the scenes in terms of policies that are being set. They're going to take time to implement. Some of the major things, and we can talk about some of this a little bit later, retail investors in Japan. As we spoke, and Hana-san spoke about uh, the aptitude of the culture to save, it's huge. That's a big, once that retail money starts to move, it's going to make a big wave, and we can talk about that later. Uh, GPIF, it's the government pension funds. They lifted constraints now, so they had caps on how much equity they can buy. Now they lifted them so there's no caps, from like 12 to 14 percent to no cap. They're searching for yield, both domestically and internationally, not just in equities, but also in, in uh, fixed income and in bonds. Uh, with uh, NISA, which is the, uh, the private savings, sort of like the uh, uh, IRAs of the United States, they too, they had a tremendous amount of people signing up. I think the number was three and a half million or so, but only 25 percent have actually funded them so far due to the markets being down right now. But once that happens, there's going to be a lot of movement in these markets, and we'll start to see it, uh, it increase. Thank you, John. I, he's mentioning these cranes in Tokyo. I go to Tokyo every month, and uh, I've been watching these cranes. And one of the interesting things is right near the U.S. Embassy, there's a brand new boulevard that's just been built. And if you've been in Tokyo, a lot of the roads were rebuilt after it was totally flattened in the war, and then they've built this up. But I've just been amazing to watch how they can take where there's been, uh, you know, uh, basically north-south streets and just go through with a new diagonal, four lanes wide, building it from the prime minister's residence down to where the site of the new Olympics is going to be. Uh, it's quite an amazing thing to see it get planned. It was actually planned by MacArthur. Uh, they call it MacArthur Boulevard. Uh, but nobody executed it until <laughs> just recently. But it's amazing to see how things get done, which is uh, quite different from uh, things here sometimes. Uh, Ambassador Chen, would you like to speak from your perspective as from the ADB and all sure. the other things you've been working on? Sure. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's a great honor to be with these uh, fellow panelists. Some of them I know from before from Tokyo. Um, you know, I spent four years working with uh, President Kuroda. I call him President Kuroda. Uh, he was the uh, head of the Asian Development Bank, where I was the U.S. ambassador, where I represented the U.S. on the board, pushing for governance changes and things. Uh, and President Kuroda is now uh, the head of the Bank of Japan. And in some way, it's the perfect job for him, because at the ADB, he was all about more money, both raising more money for the bank, great success for the bank, um, but also, and I don't think this is necessarily so wonderful, the solution often at the Asian Oil Bank or at the World Bank is more money. Uh, and so when I look at the three arrows, um, uh, um, I kind of feel it's the same old thing. And are we going to get the same old results? You know, and maybe you'll, you'll figure out my political leanings when I say you cannot tax your way to prosperity. Um, and here we are saying to the poor, suffering Japanese person, you know, I'm in Japan a lot, yeah, family in Japan. Uh, and in many ways, maybe they'll be succeed, and I really do want Abe to succeed. I think uh, uh, the world, the United States, but certainly the world will also be better off with a stronger Japan uh, to have a counterpart, to be honest, to a rising China. Um, but what we're seeing right now is that the rise of China, uh, the reemergence, in a way, of Russia on the world stage, uh, Japan's making its mark. You know, I wrote a piece for uh, CNN and Fortune at the end of last year. It was very controversial. You know, they asked me to rank who had the worst year in Asia, who had the best year in Asia. So I gave the worst year in Asia to Obama, <laughs> and you can read that. But I gave the best year uh, in Asia uh, to Abe. 
And I gave it to Abe not because of all the numbers, which to be honest go up, they go down. But when you go to Japan, there is like a new hope. You know, amongst my friends, you know, people who just suffer through everything, uh, they feel a little bit better. In a way, they feel prouder of Japan, that Japan is standing up. And I think that's a wonderful thing for Japan. But I do have fears uh, that maybe it will go the wrong way. So, you know, there's a very respected former Senate staffer, uh, uh, Keith Luce, who wrote a piece recently that Abe may well be making a mistake uh, if he's ignoring the U.S. Congress. Uh, that, you know, your president, no one had mentioned, but, you know, President Obama was just in uh, Tokyo. Uh, and so we're trying to work that bilateral relationship, which is a very important one. But uh, what I call revisionism, uh, new statements uh, from the prime minister about the sad history of World War II, of colonialism uh, in Korea and elsewhere, uh, is also back with the vengeance under Prime Minister Abe. And I think that no matter what Abe does, that is wonderful, it may well be undercut uh, by the reaction both domestically and internationally uh, to what he is saying. That may be misinterpreted, but clearly uh, the feeling is that, you know, it's like, uh, I'm going to say two kids, but it's like China saying, well, you started it. Japan saying, you started it. Korea saying, no, you both started it. Um, but all of this is happening amidst what should be a wonderful thing. A prime minister that, to be honest, is still here. You know, I spoke at the uh, Milk and Institute last year on China. Uh, and I'm so used to there being a new prime minister every year uh, in Japan. And so luckily, we have one prime minister that's still around. Uh, and you know, I said you can't tax your way to prosperity. It's hard to create change when your prime minister keeps changing. Uh, so to Japan's uh, great credit, uh, they are trying to move forward, but um, monetary uh, stimulus, fiscal stimulus, it's like more money. Who's paying for it? Again, the poor, suffering Japanese consumer. And I, what I really wanted to focus on, though, is that third arrow. And absolutely, uh, if you follow the story about the feudal lord and the sons and the three arrows, they're strong because the three arrows are together. You can't break them. But we don't have three arrows together in Japan right now. Uh, structural form isn't happening. I don't know how long has the Prime Minister been in, 16 months? You know, I challenge all of us uh, to think through what is the big structural reform that's happened in 16 months. You know, in the U.S., you know, I used to come from a uh, journalism communications background. I'll say to people, the reality is that you decide what your president or CEO is like from his first 100 days. You know, they set the tone of what they're going to accomplish. They have that honeymoon period. Uh, in some ways, Abe's honeymoon period uh, has continued well longer than 100 days. He's still there. Uh, but what is that reform he's accomplished? And so when you look at the rhetoric, sometimes the rhetoric sounds great, but then you look at the results, and uh, I can't say the results uh, have been so wonderful yet. You know, what uh, many people talked about for this trip by President Obama was, if not a big announcement on the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which is this deal that would link like 12 uh, economies, some 40 percent of the world's economy, would be linked under this uh, sort of like a free trade agreement. But the reality would create you know, a, a lot of change in Japan. Abe, whether he wasn't strong enough or he's got other things he's thinking about, uh, clearly it did not happen. Uh, but you know, that's a very complicated uh, deal. But when you look at some of the other things that people have talked about like for Japan, uh, like maybe Japan needs to rethink its energy policy, post Fukushima, Abe's plan is, well, let's go back to nuclear and let's go back to coal. right? And so maybe short term, maybe that's what they need to do. But this is not structural reform. It's like the same old stuff from before. Uh, Prime Minister Abe, to his great credit, again, speaks about something that many people talk about if you, if you work in Japan, the role of women. You know, we all, you know, one thing if you're in communications, all you'll ever remember from all of us up here are the catchy phrases. So Abenomics, you, uh, you'll remember. So the latest is Wombenomics. Uh, that <coughs> Prime Minister Abe is saying that you know, Japan has tremendous resources with its own people, right? One is it's women. Uh, uh, women are so poorly represented uh, on boards, uh, in business, uh, and um, immigrants. You know, uh, Abe, to his great credit, has talked about immigration, but the reality, nothing has happened. You know, um, uh, and so when I look at the the key for me, third arrow, structure of forms, it's a lot of talk, uh, but not a lot happening. You know, and I just want to conclude by saying. You know, I look at all this data. You know, some of the, the, the interesting things when you look at data you're comparing countries, you know, from my uh, uh, development bank infrastructure background, you know, I always love uh, the World Bank's uh, doing business report. You know, usually countries that do very poorly hate it. Uh, but uh, it's good because you have a sense of comparison between uh, countries. And so, you know, if you look at Japan, 
Um, it does okay overall. You know, I was just looking at the numbers. So overall, I think it's, uh, what, uh, number 27 out of, I don't know, maybe they rank 160 countries. Um, U.S. is number four. Singapore and Hong Kong are one and two. New Zealand, number three. Um, but when you look at the details where Japan ranks very poorly is the ability to start a business. Uh, they rank uh, number 120, which is, you know, uh, uh, not so wonderful. And again, when I say you cannot tax your way into prosperity, uh, how countries grow, how they fight poverty uh, is through business. Look at all this. It's like, well, government's going to do monetary stimulus. Government's going to do fiscal stimulus. Where is the business? Uh, and so until Japan takes seriously reforms in the corporate sector, uh, I am somewhat skeptical. I'm always hopeful uh, for Japan, but I am somewhat skeptical and I am somewhat realistic. You know, uh, when I talked about uh, governance of corporations, you know, the, I love all these little factoids that kind of weave a story uh, for you. Uh, there was one that when you look at corporations uh, in Japan, I think 1% uh, have a majority of independent directors on corporate boards. So for those of you investing in companies uh, in Japan, it, it's interesting to look at the governance. You know, Equity return rates in Japan are pretty much terrible when you compare over a longer period to elsewhere in Asia. Uh, but then you look at actual uh, how these companies are governed. Uh, you know, every country does it its own way. But it's kind of terrible if you think about it. You know, I spend a lot of time in Hachioji uh, where the power just went out. But if you go to Hachioji, I think it's Olympus it was like an Olympus town. You know, Olympus had a huge scandal, too, at the corporate uh, level. Uh, but they give a lot of money to fund concert halls and other things. And so again, it's all these kind of boondoggle projects, whether from government or companies. It's not how you're going to lead Japan into prosperity. Right. Well, thank, thank you, you, Curtis, for that. The, uh, uh, having been around Prime Minister Abe a bit in the last six months and listening to him talk and, and uh, the exchanges, I, I really have the strong feeling he really wanted to move on TPP. Uh, he was very committed to TPP, but he was very, he was getting lots of advice from his advisors about whether or not you should agree to the U.S. without TPA. And uh, speaking of the Congress, the Congress and the Obama administration's unwillingness to make uh, Obama to make a commitment to try to get t trade promotion authority out of Congress. It sort of had him leaving on this trip to Asia with one arm tied behind his back in terms of his ability to finally close. And the other thing they were looking for was Japan was willing to give 90 percent on what the U.S. was asking for, but the U.S. wouldn't give on 10 on some of these issues. And so if, you're, if there's an unwillingness to move on some of the issues, and the U.S. has some issues in which they won't move at all. So there's a, you know, it's, it's back and forth and it's a very difficult dance, but I know that uh, I can say that I know personally Abe is quite committed to TPP, and I'm sure that he will move forward on that. On um, the governance side, I think the corporate law in Japan allows, has a pretty good structure set up for that. It's just that the independent auditors, which have a very strong role in Japanese corporate governance, don't always fulfill their main sure. task of, of keeping things straight. And I, and I know there's very few gaijin directors. If I think there are a handful of them. On the yeah. side, uh, yes. would you like to comment on what's been said so far? Uh, yeah, thank you, Tokel. Um, the um, mindset is very critical uh, for the Japanese macroeconomy to move forward. Uh, the only Japan had suffered from deflation after the Second World War. It is very unique experience. In the past, uh, we have a record. Uh, for any sp uh, specific country to get out of deflation uh, through the policy measures was Japan and the United States. In Japan in 1930s, we had a serious deflationary problem. Um, and uh, at that time, the finance minister, Korekio Takahashi, uh, get, was successful to get out of deflation by policy measures by uh, lifting the gold standard system and provide a lot of uh, budget deficit, and all the JGBs, government bond, was underwritten by the Bank of Japan. Uh, in, uh, by using that method, the Takahashi finance minister tried to change the mindset from negative one to the positive, mild uh, inflationary uh, mindset. And in the United States also, the Franklin Roosevelt started to the uh, New Deal to change the mind to use the budgetary uh, money for the public construction uh, project. 
So uh, if uh, Prime Minister Abe uh, is successful to get out of deflation, I think he will be recorded maybe in the Guinness Book or something. <laughs> it's very rare, and it's not easy to change mindset. It's not the magic at all. There is a, a, a transmission mechanism supported by the economic theory. Um, as I said before, under deflationary uh, circumstances, for the company, the enterprise sector, it is the correct, the right way to hoard the money as an internal reserve instead of uh, investment because the money itself, the cash itself, uh, increase in value. So that we have to reverse that uh, mindset. And uh, there are some uh, mechanisms. First one is to raise the uh, expectation for the uh, inflation rate in the future. So expected uh, inflation rate is already reached uh, more than, uh, higher than 2%, but that uh, uh, expected inflation rate incorporate the consumption tax hike. So uh, if we consider the consumption tax hike portion around 2%, maybe the expected inflation rate is around 1%. So the nominal interest rate cannot be below zero. Of course, the cash uh, does not have any uh, any interest, nominal interest. But the expected real interest rate can be below zero, negative. And at, uh, actually, the, uh, the uh, present uh, real expected uh, interest rate is below zero, minus 1% or something, because the nominal interest rate was 0.6% for 10 years JGB. But uh, the uh, expected inflation rate is almost 1.2% or 1.4%, so 0 0.6 minus 1.4, 1.5 equal minus 0.8 or 0.7%. That is unexpected, expected real interest rate, which means that subjectively you feel that the real uh, burden of the debt will be reduced. If you borrow money from the banks, it, it, the in, real interest rate is negative. So that negative real interest rate continue to stimulate the consumption and investment at the same time. So um, although the uh, stock prices is um, uh, slowed down a little bit uh, since the beginning of this year, and the uh, uh, yen's uh, exchange rate is a kind of stable around um, 102, 101 yen per dollar, so uh, the, 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 this uh, uh, depreciation of the yen will not continue forever. Maybe somewhere appropriate zone, the, the exchange rate will be stable. So, um, but on the other hand, the, I said uh, before, the real interest rate will be negative. So uh, it takes some time uh, for you know, the financial uh, monetary policy transmitted to the real economy. It takes two years from zero to 2% mild inflation targeting, uh, it, it will take two years. So meanwhile, we have to do something because the cons consumers and the enterprise sector are very short-tempered. So we have to provide, we have to show the, some evidence that Japanese economy is, is uh, getting better. Uh, in order, for, uh, in order to, uh, to, to achieve that uh, short uh, period uh, target, we use the uh, fiscal uh, stimulus. Um, but uh, as you uh, mentioned, uh, we have a serious uh, uh, accumulated debt problem. There is uh, some uh, limit, but the fiscal stimulus uh, will bear the result very quickly. Where in uh, three months or in four months, the cons consumers and enterprise see the result of the stimulus. But on the other hand, as you said, the supply side policy takes a long time. And, um, uh, Prime Minister Abe is so uh, determined to move forward, although the concrete uh, approach is kind of gradual. Uh, in Japan, we do not like a kind of a shock therapy in terms of the structural uh, change, structural uh, reform, but uh, the d direction is so clear. So there are so many regulatory uh, uh, problems for the enterprise to start a new business or something, or uh, outsiders to ent enter into the uh, some uh, business uh, uh, sector. Uh, maybe there are some uh, uh, red carpet uh, problems, uh, bureaucratic uh, barriers. So we try to uh, get rid of the bureaucrat bureaucracy 
uh, the problems as much as possible. But uh, we, uh, it's not easy. Uh, it's easy to be said, but it's not so easy to be done. We have to be careful to uh, check what regulation is create the kind of barrier in particular uh, sector. So we have to examine the barrier, uh, how how the, the regulation works, one uh, sector uh, by sector. So, um, but the, the clear, the, the for moving forward is so uh, uh, determined. And also, uh, we have a demographic problem. The Japanese population is uh, continuing to be decreased. So we have to uh, utilize the uh, women's participation of work. So unfortunately, the uh, work participation of women in Japan is lower than the average of OECD countries. We have s or around 67-8% uh, or something, but uh, most of the uh, OECD countries are um, uh, above 70%. So uh, we have um, a lot of um, uh, available uh, workforce, uh, the women and the elderly people and younger people. So um, definitely the, the, the mindset is uh, changing. Uh, 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 conspicuously. So um, uh, I, I'm not too pessimistic, but uh, as you said uh, before, we have some risks that we have to overcome. Thank you, Hanusan. I'd like to open it up to the audience if there are questions that you have in, in mind right now. Anyone have a question they'd like to raise? Yes, ma'am. Ma'am, there's a, yeah. So two questions. Is this on? Yeah. Yes, please. Yes, um, two questions for Paul. Firstly, the headline debt to GDP number is large, 245%. Um, however, if you look at that on an external debt to GDP, it's way, way smaller. <coughs> so what's your view about that? I think people could take more comfort about that, and I think people blow out of proportion the whole debt to GDP issue. Secondly, with respect to the, um, uh, the, the so-called QE, isn't it true that um, uh, Tokyo actually was one of the highest um, bank reserves to GDP countries way before uh, QE sort of, you know, the term was coined? So, for example, if I remember correctly, even in 08, 30% of their, the balance sheet of the central bank was 30% of GDP. So what's really different this time, other than the so-called two other arrows? They've been doing this QE for a very long time under a different name, but it's the same, same outcome. I could ask you just to identify your affiliation for everyone yes, to hear. Yes, uh, Madeline and Tom Sika, the treasurer of the World Bank. Thanks very much, Madeline. I used to work with Madeline years ago, so <laughs> nice to, to re uh, see her again. Um, so, yes, yeah, so just on the first question, so Madeline's pointing out the fact that, that if you look at the gross debt to GDP in Japan, how much has been run up, it's something like 235, 240%. It looks terrible. Um, if you look at it on a net basis, it's a little bit better. That is, netting out financial assets uh, that the government has, it's more like 135%. It's still very high. But if you look, um, if you think about uh, here's how I'd, I'd answer it, Madeline. You have to make a distinction when people talk about Japan has a debt problem versus the Japanese government has a debt problem. Because Japan has been running a current account surplus since the beginning of the 1980s. It's actually coming down now and may disappear. But about 35 years of current account surplus, roughly around about 3% of GDP every year. And that's essentially Japan net. Uh, increasing its, exter its claims on the rest of the world, it's lending money to the rest of the world at the rate of about 3% of GDP per year. So from the point of view of Japan as a consolidated unit, it doesn't really have a debt problem. But within Japan, of course, it's a government sector on the one hand and a private sector on the other hand. And the government has run up a lot of debt, uh, partly because the private sector has been wanting to run up a lot of net financial savings. And why is that? Well, the demography has been one factor because it's been an aging society. People have been accumulating uh, assets for the future. Uh, but also the corporate sector is not investing as much as it used to. And so there's an imbalance internally. So yes, I think the bottom line is that um, the headline numbers that you would see that would frighten the living daylight, daylights out of you uh, are actually not quite as bad. Now, on the second point, um, I think your question there is, well, you know, OK, so Kuroda's doing this quantitative easing, but hasn't it sort of been done before? Well, I would argue um, that, it, that uh, the way it was done before was very, very different. Now, 
I don't want to get too technical here, but you mentioned uh, central bank reserves, that's the sort of the quantitative part of quantitative easing, actually being very high in Japan, uh, 30, 40 percent, something like that. It's going up rapidly now. Um, that's not in and of itself, it's not the level of reserves itself that's so important, um, uh, or, the, or actually the level of the balance sheet of the central bank, <coughs> pardon me, uh, so much as the rate of change of that variable, because the size of the central bank, bank's balance sheet to a large extent reflects cash in circulation, which is the public's demand for funds. And Japan being a cash-orientated society, and having been in deflation for close to 20 years, there's enormous demand for cash. So it's, it's erroneous to look at the central bank's balance sheet and say, oh my goodness, as a percentage of GDP, it's much bigger than the Fed's uh, balance sheet. So don't criticize us for not doing enough monetary stimulus to an economist who knows his or her uh, central bank's balance sheets. That's a fallacious argument. And actually, that was the kind of argument that the Bank of Japan used to make before Mr. Kuroda came along. You mentioned bank reserves again. Let me give you one statistic. Under the first round of quantitative easing in Japan, from 2001 to 2006, at the maximum point, the Bank of Japan expanded its balance sheet by about, sorry, expanded its balance sheet by about 40%. It had a seven-fold increase in reserves, but reserves is only one component of the liabilities. If you look at the overall balance sheet, it was about a 40% increase. The Federal Reserve in 2008 increased its balance sheet by 100% in one month. And now, after QE 1, 2, and 3, the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve is about 366% bigger than when it started. Under Governor Shirakawa, up until last March, the expansion of the balance sheet since the financial crisis was about 50%. Under Mr. Kuroda, it's already about 140%. So I don't think when you look at the numbers, there's any doubt that um, the Bank of Japan is doing quantitative easing much, much more aggressively. But even more importantly is the message from the Bank of Japan is different. And Mr. Honda talked about the need <coughs> for the central bank to act on the public's inflation expectations. If you don't do that, right. you're not even in the ring, and they're doing that now. That's a key point. Yes. Uh, Alec, oh, thank you. Uh, Alec Ellison uh, with Jefferies. Uh, Mr. Honda, you quantify the decline of real interest rates to the point where they're negative. Let's call that a financial repression that's occurring. Paul, you talked about the conservative nature of uh, uh, retirement investing, pension investing. John, you talked a little bit about the, um, uh, the retail investor. And I'm not sure who it was who talked about the demographics. So the question is, when does the pension industry in Japan, and ultimately to the extent they matter, the retail investor, stop tolerating negative returns on their investment and start putting money into risk securities, particularly equities. What causes that to tip, or do the demographics just maintain this uh, conservative type of investing that tolerates negative 0.8 to 1.0 percent uh, returns instead of really investing in the real economy? Let John take the first shot at answering. Sure. I tried to cover everybody on the panel. Yeah, so. Did a good job. Appreciate it. <laughs> well, let, let's look at the retail investor. and. Um, expectations of inflation uh, are very, very important, as we said. Um, like we said, it's booming, cranes, the city, the people have a new renowned vigor in them than before. Retail savings in Japan is equivalent to about $16 trillion. That's a huge number. I think people underestimate how powerful that is in, in the transfer of funds in the world. If you look at corporate America has uh, access of two trillion uh, in, in capital, and DC and the Washington administration has been doing all they can to try to take some of that money and stimulate the U.S. economy. We have 16 trillion sitting in retail investment in Japan. Of that, 50 percent or approximately is in cash. Now, 40 odd percent of it is in uh, fixed income and between 5 to 10 percent is in equities. Now a move from 5 percent, one percentage point will change approximately the math is 6 percent increase in the Nikkei. So if we get any kind of transfer of wealth to grasp for yield like everything else is happening, it's going to be a huge move. Our predictions of the Nikkei by the year end is 18,000. Um, we also think that uh, the yen's going to be around 110. 
So uh, that's something that we're awakening a big giant, and people underestimate what's going to happen, as well as all the other mandatory things that are going in for GPIF, for NISA, where you have to allocate more into equities and for outside foreign money for higher yields. You can't be buying JGBs at you know, 0.62 in the 10 years when treasuries are trading <coughs> at multiples of that. So that's starting to happen. It's going to take some time. It's been 20 odd years. But the philosophy and the people are starting to get it. And if deflation, and you had 50% in cash, you can keep it in cash, because tomorrow you can buy this for cheaper. Now, it's not going to happen. So when that mentality starts to sink in, and the retail investor, Mr. and Mrs. Watanabe, figure out, I can't keep 50% of my holdings in cash anymore. I have to move it out. There's going to be a huge transfer of wealth, and that's when we're going to start to see a real big kick in, and all three of the arrows are going to start to work. That's a good story. Do you have any other comment on that? No? Paul, do you have a comment? Well, I mean, just to, to sort of just add to what, what John said, I think there's, there's a, there is an important point here, which is that if you really believe that Japan is, a, is in the process of being dislodged by policy from a 20-year, 15 to 20-year deflation, then it stands to reason that can only happen if the Japanese people themselves change their view of future price expectations. And if those very same people uh, have these financial portfolios, which are predicated on continuing deflation, that doesn't, doesn't add up. So if, you, if you're a real believer in Abenomics, and you really believe that Japan is reflating, then it's a natural, logical consequence that there should, at some point, sooner rather than later, be a significant portfolio rebalance shift in Japan and that itself should have a very, very reflationary effect. What worries me is we haven't seen that to date. And that is also evidence that the mindset of Japanese households is not, and institutional investors, is not yet how do we, changing. How and do we change that mindset? Trigger. How do we how do we get that over the edge to your point? Because I agree with all the facts and everything, but how do you move the people to see that? Do you think there's an under uh, you know, in Japan, a lot of things moves under the surface. You don't see it. The people have moved way over here, and then one day it pops up, and you're all of a sudden you're way over here. But I don't see that under the table movement well, yet. I, sorry, I don't want to hog the show here, but but to me, the, the critical thing would be to really follow through on this policy agenda and make no mistakes about it. In right. other words, absolutely nail deflation, and that's why you know I've been concerned about the fiscal hikes, the consumption tax hikes, because it's sort of like, do you really want to handicap yourself in the, in the middle of this process by doing that? And secondly, we haven't really talked too much about structural reform, but if <laughs> demographics has come up, the driver of Japan's decline in real growth and potential growth is demographics. And unless you do some, unless you're serious about doing something about that, you can't get uh, over real growth of the kind they're talking about. Now, what would that package look like labor force participation has been mentioned, but I think it needs to be three things in a sort of holistic fashion. One is increasing labor force participation, but that mustn't come at the sacrifice of the fertility rate. Right. The fertility rate has to be raised you know, above replacement level. It's 1.4 at the moment, replacement <coughs> level is 2.1. You've got to get it above replacement level. And thirdly, you need to have immigration if you're serious about turning around this labor force trend. Somebody mentioned that Prime Minister Abe is embracing immigration. Um, I wish that were the case. I think what he's starting to embrace is foreign workers coming into the country for a number of years on the premise that they leave again. That is not immigration. Yeah, John? <laughs> yes, I think, I think policy is being set as we speak. A lot of this is really fresh. And it's going to take time. It's a huge ship, and it's turning. It takes a long time to turn. Some of these policies are a month old. Yeah. So the mindset is changing. We're starting to see the drips and drabs. Policies are mandating for, for, for all the different things that we spoke about, from money to move into more yielding products. So it's happening. It's going to take time. But we're seeing clear evidence that it's going that way. Yes, sir. Uh, <coughs> Abenomics is uh, necessary. Yeah, yeah, just identify yourself. Yeah, I'm, my name is Wei Ming Yuan. I'm just a concerned uh, uh, a person about uh, 
uh, future in uh, Asia, Japan, Korea, China, United States included, uh, because I lived and studied in all these countries. Uh, abenomics is important and it's necessary because, and I too, like Mr. Chen, I hope it will succeed because a dynamic and re-energized Japan can only help the world. However, I see lately, within the last year and a half or so, so much energy and emotion wasted because Japan refuses to be an Asian country. Don't you think it's awkward that Abe, Mr. Abe has not met Mrs. Park or Ms. Park or Mr. Xi? We are wasting a lot of unnecessary energy and emotion. He's been trying to, I mean, it's not, they did meet, of course, with President Obama in, in uh, Brussels, I think, last month. And there is an, uh, there are efforts to get the meetings on the agenda, but I appreciate that comment. Yes, sir, one more, one last comment here. Sorry about that. Uh, this is Alex von Furstenberg, Ranger Investments. I have a question. Can you get a decent return in Japan? So all of these capital flows are clearly going to go where they get the better return. Can you get a decent return in these new cranes, these new buildings, these new in anything? Uh, well, I, I thought I was going to turn to the, in, the investor here, sure. John, but I mean, from an economic standpoint, uh, you know, well, two things I'd note, obviously, is that, uh, and again, you have to talk between nominal and real returns, but you know, we do have 10-year JGBs sitting at around about 60 basis points. So that's the anchor for all the financial assets. Um, that's not a very high return. Uh, secondly, you know, the real economic returns will come from, you know, real economic growth. Uh, and well, so there can be individual projects that you get a good return on, but that, I come back to the sort of demographics arguments. Um, Abenomics, the, the, the aim of Abenomics is to average 2% real growth over the next decade. Uh, the past decade has been 0 0.8. The potential growth is estimated by the Cabinet Office to be about 0.7%, but with the demographics, it's, it's declining. So to get, you know, decent, consistent, real returns, you're going to need to lead, lead, leverage growth a lot, a lot higher. And I just don't see those policies being put in place at the moment. Mr. Honda? Oh, yes, thank you. Uh, with regard to the um, uh, balance sheet of the public sector, the Japanese uh, gross uh, debt are huge. But um, net uh, deficit are comparable to that of the United States. So uh, still it's big, but uh, not so uh, serious situation yet. And um, in addition, all the Japanese uh, national debt are issued in uh, Japanese yen denominated. So um, that is completely different from the case of uh, Greece or Latin America. So um, if something happened, the Bank of Japan can handle. The Bank of Japan uh, qualify to issue uh, Japanese yen as much as possible. So uh, don't worry too much. We will deal with the huge uh, national debt uh, uh, very carefully, and the, the Japanese de deficit should be manageable. So the, the two important indicators are there. The one is national debt over the nominal GDP. The first uh, priority for us is to uh, uh, enhance the nominal GDP so that the denominator Make, should be as big as possible. The second one is primary balance. So the target is, uh, we have two-fold target. By 2015, we should, um, uh, uh, primary deficit be halved compared to the 2012 at uh, uh, 10. And to, by 2020, they, we should reach the primary uh, uh, surplus. So uh, we will uh, do it by first the getting out deflation and enhance the uh, nominal GDP. And if necessary, we have to increase the consumption tax rate again sometime later. Thank you. We've run out of time here. If th is your question quick? OK, we could spend, I, I apologize. We ran out of time on that. Thank you all very much for being here. And thank you, thank you. my fellow.